On July 4th of 1827, New York State declared that all enslaved people in their state were free. Now, then in September of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. Fugitive Slave Act stated that any slave who was in a free state could be captured and brought back to a slave state, even if they had been granted their freedom. Habeas corpus, to tie these together, is a recourse in law through which a person can report an unlawful detention or an imprisonment to a court and request that the court order the custodian of the person, usually a prison official, to bring the prisoner to court to determine whether the detention is lawful. And this came into play in New York in the 1850s. There was a couple named Jonathan and Julie Lemon. Now, they owned slaves. Now, the Lemons lived in Virginia, and Virginia, slavery was legal. So the Lemons began to travel, and they were traveling from Virginia to Texas, and they were bringing eight slaves with them. And Texas was another slave state. So they were going through New York at the time, and this was the easiest route to make it to Texas. New York, as we said at the beginning, was not a slave state. And New York also had a law that said that if any slave was brought into the state for any purpose, would be freed automatically. Now, the Lemons, they had no intent to sell their slaves while they were on their trip. So while their ship was docked, in the New York Harbor overnight, the Lemons kept their slaves on land in New York. Now, a resident of New York was named by the name of Louis Napoleon, petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus, arguing that the slaves on land in New York were free. The Lemons argued that their only purpose of temporarily being in New York was passage to Texas. But the Supreme Court ruled that those slaves, the New York Supreme Court ruled that those slaves were free. So in this case, change came eventually. And everything in that case was everything. Welcome to the Stephen Thompson Experience. My name is Stephen Thompson, and this is my experience. I use history and music to make connections with the goal of informing, educating, and inspiring others to go out and live and serve and love others around them. And hopefully, together, we can do our part in making our parts of the world just a little bit better. And the song this week, Everything is Everything by Lauren Hill. And it was the third and what would be the final single from her recording, her debut album, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, which came out in 1998. The song came out in May of 1999, and it was written by Hill and produced by Hill. And when you listen to the song, you'll hear little bits of R&B, a little bit of 1960s soul, and a dash of hip hop. Now, one of the facts about the song, interesting facts, is that Hill found a piano player who was 19 years old and a student in college at the University of Pennsylvania. And that pianist was the musician John Legend. He played piano on that album. Now, what the term means is that all is well and everything is going according to plan. Now, Facts about this song is she wrote this song to mark the end of two years that were very challenging for her. It was the end of her relationship with Wyclef Jean, the Fugees broke up, and she had a temporary loss of faith in God. And she called this perhaps a return to a brighter space. And this song gained a lot of critical acclaim. It was on the top 40 in the Billboard 100 chart. It also 
was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Short Form Video. And along with that, it also received a Grammy nomination for Best Song of the Year. So everything is everything. And what she was talking about, she wanted to write this song about injustice and struggles. Let's talk about some injustice and struggle. We saw that at the beginning of the story. when We talked a little bit about the, the case of the Lemmings and their eight slaves. And the Lemmings and their eight slaves, that story, the slaves were defended by a young 24-year-old lawyer. And this lawyer would also appear in another case in the 1850s in New York. This was the case of Elizabeth Jennings. Elizabeth Jennings was going to church and she was a school teacher and she got on the Third Avenue railroad car in New York at the corner of Pearl and Chapman. And when she got on, the conductor told her to get off, to wait for the next car because the next car would be accepting African-American riders. But Jennings didn't. She said, I'm staying on this, this rail car and I am going to go to church. Well, she was forcibly removed from this rail car, from this mode of transportation and thrown into jail. Then she brought a case against the streetcar company. And that case was, was tried and her lawyer was 24 year old Chester Arthur. And Arthur went in front of the New York state judge and the judge at the time was a man named William Rockwell. And Rockwell told the jury, all male jury, all white jury that under the law, colored persons, if sober, well-behaved and free from disease have the right to ride the streetcars and could neither be excluded by any rules of the company, nor by force or by violence. So Elizabeth Jennings was given $250. Now she had asked for $500, but she got $250. And New York streetcars were supposed to integrate at that time, but they didn't. So her father formed the Thomas Jennings her father, Thomas Jennings, founded the Legal Rights Association to challenge the streetcars who were not integrating, even though his daughter Elizabeth had won her court case. But it took to 1861 for the entire system of New York streetcars to be desegregated. So Elizabeth Jennings, after that time, she continued to teach. She got married and had a son but her son passed away when he was one years old. And when her husband passed away, she started New York's first kindergarten for black students. And her motto was love of the beautiful. And that is what she wanted to instill in the young minds that went to her school. And Elizabeth Jennings died in 1901. Now, the winner of both the Lemmings case and the Jennings case was Chester Arthur. Chester Arthur went on to be a brigadier general in the Civil War and then became vice president under James Garfield. And then when James Garfield was assassinated, Chester Arthur became the 21st president of the United States. So we see elements of change and, and slow change happening in, in these stories. And here are some of the lyrics from the song. Sometimes it seems we'll touch that dream, but things come slow or not at all. And the ones on top will make it stop, so convinced that they might fall. Let's love ourselves and we can't fail to make a better situation. Tomorrow our seeds will grow. 
All we need is dedication. Let me tell you that everything is everything. Everything is everything. After winter must come spring. Everything is everything. Change it comes eventually. The book of Proverbs has a saying, a one sentence saying in Proverbs 16, 32. It says, better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. Patience. Patience. The idea of a patient person being better than a warrior, a person with self-control, is better than one who takes a city. That's what the proverb is saying. And it's, it's almost uncomfortable to believe because we believe in a, we live in a society that I believe honors the warrior and honors the person who takes the city. And we don't actually honor the idea of being patient or being self-controlled. But, 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 think, listen to this for a second. Impatience actually could be harmful. There was a study published by the Journal of American Medical Association that says impatient causes the body to release a stress hormone called cortisol. And that stress hormones stimulate your platelets, making them more likely to clot in the arteries that could already be narrowed and smaller by heart disease. And that process can result in a heart attack. And also these hormones can cause the body's fat cells to release fat into the bloodstream. So this idea of impatience and, and rushing is actually very unhealthy for you. So the idea of slowing down and being patient because change is going to come eventually. You see, winter began on 1221. 21. And spring began on March 20th, 2022. This is the day I'm actually recording this. Might not be the day that you're listening to it, but this is the day I'm recording it. So that's 90 days. 90 days in between winter and spring. And we can't rush a day. A day is 24 hours. No matter our mood or our to-do list, our expectations. You know, we can be self-controlled and we can have a sense of urgency by embracing the power of patience. You see, change requires perseverance, sustained effort, even when the outcome doesn't go the way you want it to. Perhaps you're ignored or you're opposed or you're criticized and you acknowledge, in fact, that it could have hurt or that it was undeserved injustice or even unjust, like I said, undeserved, like Elizabeth Jennings, or like the slaves, the eight slaves owned by the Lemmings. But you know what? There is a choice that we have when faced with being ignored or being opposed or being criticized. We can stop and not move forward in our endeavors, or we can continue to move in the direction of the desired outcome that you envisioned when you began your journey. And as Lauren Hill says, after winter, must come spring. Thank you for listening to the Stephen Thompson Experience. I come here to educate, inform, and inspire. My hope is that you will decide to lead with the gifts and the skills and the competencies that you possess. Check me out, the Stephen Thompson Experience. We have this podcast. We also have a website called the Stephen Thompson Experience. All you have to do is type in the Stephen Thompson Experience online. Subscribe to my YouTube channel which is also called the Stephen Thompson Experience. I got a great series talking about coffee and creativity and giving you very simple and easy things to implement into your life. I got two books, Up the Nose and Back Out Again and Aquafuncopus and The Macrocosm of Mayhem. You'll find them on Amazon. Take care. Have a great week. 
I'll be back in this spot next week. See you later. Bye-bye.